we finally have some good science to put to this, and unfortunately it wasn't from my lab. This is the beautiful work of Susanna Soberg, who's over in Scandinavia, published a paper in Cell Reports Medicine showing that the threshold you're trying to hit each week is at least, you can do more, but at least 11 minutes of uncomfortable but safe cold exposure per week total. So that could be three minutes Monday, three minutes Wednesday, so yep. so on, to 11 minutes, and 57 minutes per week minimum <laughs> so, so of sauna. Precise. That's what they found. <laughs> What did they find? Increases brown fat thermogenesis, thereby metabolism, thereby comfort being you know in cold, et cetera. Um, clearly there's a resilience effect. Clearly there's a dopamine increasing effect. And clearly you can do more. You could do all that in one day or you could spread it out throughout the week or you could do more. It kind of depends on what you're shooting for. How cold, people always say, how cold, how hot? Well, for heat, is generally uh, between 187 degrees Fahrenheit and 212 degrees Fahrenheit somewhere in that range. And for cold, it's cold enough that you really want to get the hell out, but that you can stay in safely because I don't want anyone to kill themselves with doing this stuff. We can delineate some protocols. If you want to get better, more resilient, cold exposure is going to be great anytime. Post-cold exposure, your body is going to heat up. Think of your body heating up as waking up. So if you are concerned about not being able to sleep, then I would suggest you do your cold exposure earlier in the day. Heat does the opposite. So I'm laying out some parameters here. Heat does the opposite. You're going to heat up while you're in the deliberate heat exposure. But afterwards, there's a post-heating dip in temperature. So sauna at night is great as well. Now let's think about how to combine these things. So let's say you, you, you know, you're on, a, it's a Tuesday, you've done your weight training on Monday, um, and you want to do your heat and cold. You don't have time to optimize everything perfectly. You could say, okay, I'm going to do my um, heat and cold at 10 a.m. or 8 a.m., you get in the sauna for 20 minutes or so, and then you get into the cold for three minutes. And then you might get into the sauna again for 10 minutes, and you get in the cold for another minute or so. You end on cold. Yes. Why? Because it'll wake you up, and presumably you're not, you want to be woken up for the day. Now, there is what I call the Soberg principle, uh, which is if you are using deliberate cold exposure to increase metabolism, end on cold. So finish on the cold, not just because it wakes you up more, but because then you have to heat your body up naturally, which is a thermogenic metabolic response. So end with cold. And if you really want to push it, you can do things like don't use a towel, use evaporation, uh, spread out your limbs and don't huddle so that you have to shiver more, et cetera. I mean, there are a lot of little games you can play. But let's say you want to reduce post-exercise inflammation. You're not concerned with hypertrophy gains, of, of muscle size gains or strength gains. Well, then get in the cold after your, your workout do that for one to, some people can do 10 minutes, reduce inflammation. Let's say you really want to hit growth hormone. The biggest effects of sauna on growth hormone, and they are big effects, are when the sauna is only done once per week, but it's done in four cycles or sets, we could say, of 30 minutes each. So that means 30 minutes in the sauna at the temperatures I described before, then a five minute break, just air cooling off or 10 minute break, then back into the sauna for 30 minutes. This is brutal. Then again in the afternoon, 30 minutes in the sauna, then 10 minutes just air cooling off and then back into the sauna for 30 minutes. So that's two hours at 187 to 212 degrees. In one day. So you have to be very careful, right? Heat can kill you, you gotta hydrate, you need to make sure you get enough salt. Like, it, I mean, this is, this is work, right? Um, but you get, you see in these human studies up to 16 fold increases in growth hormone. So you can imagine this could exert some very strong reparative effect if you're training for a big event or endurance event, or, or maybe you're just really wiped out from the week. This is a stressor, but it's a stressor that delivers a potent growth hormone response. Now, if you do sauna more often than that, you're not going to want to do two hours a day in the sauna because presumably you're doing other things. And in addition to that, the growth hormone effect starts to diminish if you become too heat adapted. And that raises a more interesting question perhaps, which is why is it that this two hour protocol really works if you do it once a week to increase growth hormone? It's because it's a stressor and certain stressors increase growth hormone. Does it have to be heat? No, you could probably also do four really long rounds of ice bath. And I'm guessing you'd probably see a similar effect. No one's ever really looked. You'd probably see a similar effect because it's all about the stress stimulus. Now, those that work on exercise science and weight training would probably say, yeah, you could also do a, this has been shown, you know, a 90 minute, 10 sets of 10, multiple exercises for 10 sets of 10, high volume, German volume training, workout and get the same growth hormone effects. There's so many studies like this. I personally like to do the sauna two or three days a week, but 
if I'm traveling abroad, I don't have the time, then I might do, I might take a day. I'm thinking, wow, I did three podcasts. I'm exhausted. Now, most people are trying to incorporate this into their daily life. And just like, as we said, for ice bath, if you don't have access to ice or ice bath or cold tub, you do cold shower or longer cool baths. With heat, I realize not everyone has access to a sauna. Hot baths do work. Now, one thing about hot baths and hot sauna is they will nuke your sperm. They will reduce viable sperm count. So for males that are trying to re reproduce, you know, trying to create children, you want to be careful about hot baths and hot sauna too often. Some people will bring a cold pack in and put it in their groin. You can't do that in a bath. Actually, there's a, a kind of interesting relationship between cold and testosterone thermog and spermatogenesis. There is a little cottage industry out there. I think on Amazon, people will buy these gel pack underwear of cool. I think they're called snowballs. This is co cooling the scrotum in order to try and increase spermatogenesis. Okay. Now I'm not aware of any data on this, but people report anic data and have shown their blood work and stuff that it, it actually works to increase testosterone levels. I find this sort of amusing on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I think what we're arriving at is some general principles of physiology, which are that light, exercise, temperature, both heat and cold, are all very powerful stimuli for creating hormonal and neuromodulator dopamine epinephrine effects. And when you start to dig beneath the surface of all these protocols, Wim Hof breathing, ice baths, sauna, um, snowballs, what you are finding is that these are all different stimuli to tap into these different neuromodulator systems, right? You know, sunlight on our skin and on and into our eyes organizes all these hormone cycles. There's a beautiful study out of uh, Israel just this last year, peer reviewed study showing that if men and women are told to go outside and get a lot of sunlight exposure on their skin for 20 minutes a day, three times a week. Testosterone and estrogen levels go up substantially. Feelings of desire and sexual passion go up. You know, there's a real effect of the summer months for people. And it's hormonal, and that's because the skin is an endocrine organ. Um, th these effects shouldn't surprise us. And some people hear these and they go, oh, so basically you're just telling us to like get sunlight and exercise and eat well and, you know, and avoid bright lights at night so that you can sleep. But yeah, that's basically what we're saying. We're saying that because there's now substantial physiology to support that. There's nothing new in terms of the mechanisms. The mechanisms haven't evolved in, we believe, hundreds of thousands of years, if not more. The ways to tap into these systems are many. High intensity interval training, you're going to get increase in adrenaline. Yoga Nidra, meditation, a nap, you're gonna get increases in serotonin. So it's not trivial though. I wanna be really clear. These sorts of things are not trivial. They are exceedingly powerful because they tap into systems that we all harbor. So the beautiful thing is they work the first time and they work every time. And there are very few things you can say that about. They work the first time and they work every time. And the reasons they work are now becoming clear to us through these more high quality studies.